Um, we're happy to welcome um, artist, the famous artist Timothy Schmaltz here to Catholic News World. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to have a break to talk to you about sculpture and artwork. Wonderful. So maybe you could tell the audience at Catholic News World a little bit about yourself and your artwork. Yes, I have uh, I have been sculpting for more than 30 years obsessively, um, principally Christian sculpture. And that is essentially um, the way not only do I prayer, but I, I believe this is this is the way of, of of evangelizing with sculpture. And so, yes, I've been sculpting uh, for 30 years. Uh, a lot of my sculptures are uh, placed in uh, historical uh, cathedrals, basilicas, in many different places around the world. And I am obviously uh, in search of new ways of expressing these eternal truths. So I, I'd say to describe myself, um, it would be devoted to Christian artwork. Wonderful. And could you also mention, I notice uh, some of your artwork is in the Vatican. Maybe say a little bit about Pope Francis and your artwork. Yes, I had the uh, absolute privilege to be uh, the creator of the Angels Unaware sculpture. It's a sculpture that uh, in the uh, 2019 was installed in St. Peter's Square, and it is an epic sculpture that is a celebration of migration um, with more than 140 different figures from all historical periods, uh, all, um, all different uh, uh, places from the globe that uh, were impacted by uh, migration throughout the centuries. So in a sense, everyone. It's a sculpture that uh, holds everyone on a boat uh, or a raft. I think it's more like a boat. And in the center of this crowd of people, um, there is an angel, but you can only see the angel's wings uh, due to the crowd of people. In a sense, the wings then visually become everyone's wings. The title of the piece Hebrew, uh, inspired by Hebrews 13, Angels Unawares. In uh, that, that scripture, it says, Be welcoming to strangers. Many have entertained angels unawares. And so it, really, it was a, a very, very epic project to do. Like I mentioned, it's a, it's a sculpture park within one sculpture. And right now I'm working on another similar 20-foot sculpture on the theme of human trafficking and modern-day slavery. And the hero on that piece is St. Paquita, who's actually letting the oppressed go free. And that's the title of the sculpture. And it uh, brings a, a visual spotlight on, on human trafficking around the world. And so these both are kind of, I like to call them weapons to, to actually attack the injustices that are uh, globally hitting us, uh, one with migration and refugees and the other with human trafficking. And so, yeah, these two projects are some of my largest pieces and some of my exciting pieces after 30 years of sculpting. It, it's a, a real test to do, to do such subject matter and at such size. Magnificent. Um, what an incredible amount of work you've done and um, so inspiring. Um, could you tell us a little bit uh, your thoughts on the current situation and racism and sculpture and, and what you think about that? Yeah, naturally, I'm uh, very interested in what's going on uh, around the world about the uh, uh, destruction of, of statues and um I think when you, when you create a sculpture, you are creating a part of a culture. And um, so in a sense, um, uh, sculpture statues are in the crossfire of what's going on today. And um, I like to think that there's, there's two, two uh, points that I'd like to make. And one is generally, I think that um, uh, the movement 
to destroy sculptures, um, to remove them, to put them in museums, um, is not very kind of sympathetic to the progress of humanity as far as morality is concerned. Um, a hundred years ago, we had a different morality than we do today. And we keep on evolving and growing and hopefully improving uh, as, as the centuries continue. And I do believe that um, removing or destroying sculptures that showed signs of a different morality than the one we're used to today is not really sensitive to history. And I think it could be possibly dangerous because in a sense, we're not being sympathetic to those people and we're being very callous about um, that um, history and those people. They were a product of their times. Um, and like I mentioned, that, that our, our morality is evolving, thank God. Um, but I think it's kind of arrogant uh, and scapegoating to attack our history with such uh, violent destruction. I like to say that it's easy to uh, to destroy. It takes two minutes to destroy a statue to topple it, but it's a lot more difficult to to create. And that's why one of my alternatives to the destruction or removal of the sculptures is more sculpture, any more. Um, not only uh, brand new sculptures uh, that showcase uh, historical injustices but to supplement some of the historical monuments with some sculptural aspects that describe the history. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, I think, with the public sculpture, the secular historical uh, sculpture. Um, I think it's also like uh, my, one of my favorite uh, thinkers is Rene Girard, and he would talk about your scapegoating the past. You're suggesting that... Um, if we were there, we would have done something different. We would have acted different. And that's not necessarily the case. It's, it's, it's pulled out of this, this social, historical um, culture that existed, that changed over the years. And so I think it's, that, that's, that's what I have to say. Let's not destroy, let, let's create, let's add more. Let, let, let's, let's create a deeper understanding and leave the monuments that had uh, perhaps some negative uh, morality within the past of that uh, person or within that culture, um, almost as a as a silent witness to it. But let's add more. Let's let's bring about uh, a dialogue and a learning experience with sculpture. And with Christian artwork too, some people recently have been criticizing um, all these white uh, representations of Jesus. Um, I don't really find a problem with that, um, simply because um, historically Christianity was really part uh, seamless to the, to the European culture. Um, now things have changed. Um, we are now a more globalized world than we were in the 1600s. Um, I think that, um, again, we should add more sculptures, um, and that's one of the uh, projects I've been doing for the last couple of years is doing uh, uh, representations of Jesus that are black um, and other ethnicities. And I think that's important. Our work is a bridge. Our work um, has to try to uh, make all people see God within their own lives and make, uh, make Christianity approachable. And yet one of the, the ways of doing that is by adding that specific ethnicity to that sculpture, which I think is really cool. And if you look at the history of, of uh, Christian artwork, uh, the Renaissance, uh, you look at the Last Supper, that's a, that's a European, that's a Florence kitchen table there, or a dining room table. What's going on here? Well, they were doing that there throughout the whole history of Christian artwork. They've always adopted, the, or many times they've adopted the biblical scene to fit the contemporary, current cultural surroundings um, and it wasn't necessarily out of ignorance but it was at the point where they wanted to use artwork as a tool to motivate people and to to kind of uh, make a connection towards that biblical story likewise the same should be happening today so that's where I stand on that 
Wonderful. So art and sculpture can certainly help the racial tensions in the situation that's going on today. Um, also, um, how can, um, f how does faith inspire your work? Well, faith is the reason why I sculpt. Um, when I was uh, a teenager, I wanted to be a sculptor, and I basically um, was at an artistic crisis when I turned 19, because a lot of the contemporary artwork out there is filled with sound and theory, but it really signifies nothing. Um, one of the one of the fashionable, uh, which seems to have been lasting for more than a hundred years, is this idea of shock art. That it, and I've heard some art critics say, if it's not shocking, it's not artwork. And I find that whole. Um, philosophy on artwork that it should be shocking, it has to be new, or it's not artwork, um, kind of robs art of a more powerful uh, position um, it used to have and should reclaim right now. And that's a spiritual um, celebration, uh, a spiritual tool um, to help people uh, become closer to God. And that's historically how it was. Even pre-Christian, most of the sculpture was attached to to a, a religious uh, aspect. And only, I think, you know, till the late 1800s was the, the shift almost complete with the, uh, with the movement of modern artwork. I think that um, um, what that does to artwork is it makes it really trite and it makes these kind of these cute visual puns, but it doesn't help um, create masterpieces. Um, if you look at the Sistine Chapel, for instance, and you try to remove the subject that's being represented, um, it would fall to the floor. And I like to, to give a, a perfect uh, kind of example is that uh, the Pieta, Michelangelo's Pieta, one of the most beautiful sculptures ever created. If you took the same stone block, the same skill to carve the, the, the marble block, but instead of having the Pieta, which is the dead Christ uh, on the lap of Mary, instead of that, if you have dancing poodle, it would just be ludicrous. And so you got the skill, you got the material, but you need the subject matter. I go so far as to think that um, that artwork, visual art, is just the skin that covers an idea. And depending on the power of that idea will depend on the power of that sculpture. And so naturally, I think all great artwork is clinging and a part, an extension an expression of something spiritual and something awesome. And so that right away when I was 19, when I rejected my art school and the common trends of, of artwork and jumped straight into doing Christian sculptures and only Christian sculptures, I found myself at absolute peace. And I also felt that here, artwork is serving a function and a very important function. And if I'm serving artwork to serve this function, I felt I felt a, a sense of self worth. And uh, it's interesting because when you create a piece of artwork, um, it is a form of communication. I do believe it's like a homily. And um, so I'm working on creating pieces to be put out in the environment to actually preach. It's a really fascinating project. Wonderful. Yeah, a picture can say a thousand words and perhaps your sculptures can say an infinite number of words. That's so lovely. Um, so what is your message maybe for youth? How can youth be um, touched by your work? I think youth right now, as I think many times, um, are cynical, jaded, and are very intelligent. And I think oftentimes we forget about how smart and intelligent they are. And if I 
I get a compliment from a youth, I feel that's a really uh, uh, great thing. And I, so when I'm doing a sculpture, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I kind of run my, my design and the idea through uh, a mill of cynicism and criticism. And I want to present uh, Christian sculpture that the cynical youth would appreciate. And if they appreciate my sculpture, well, they're in a sense appreciating what I'm representing. And so this oftentimes, I feel that good artwork is a gateway, an entrance, a doorway into the spiritual, into that saint's life, into understanding the crucifixion. And if that gateway is something that attracts people to walk through, then I'm doing my job. But I find oftentimes um, artwork, Christian artwork, can be a locked gate where um, it kind of become something that um, no young person uh, would become curious about or interested about. And then so it becomes it becomes a fist instead of a welcoming hand. And I think oftentimes that's, that's uh, not intentional, obviously, but it's done by kind of what I call the cookies and cream. Um, Christianity is not cookies and cream. Christi- Christianity is... It, it will it will challenge you beyond your wildest expectations. It will ask more from you than any other thing possible. It will also be comfort. It will also be love. It will also be peace. But too often, only the comfort, the love, and the peace is represented in the artwork. And what I'd like to say is that's not a, a very um, accurate representation of what Christianity is. And so on my artwork, I'm, I'm taking and I'm pulling out ideas from the Bible that are that shocking, that are that, that challenge, that are that invitation to go beyond. And oftentimes, that's not visible in artwork. It's only in text or it's only in a homily. But to freeze that in a sculpture is really cool, like my Homeless Jesus sculpture. The Homeless Jesus sculpture um, is a sculpture I created that's a visual translation of Matthew 25. And it's interesting because people say it's shocking to see Jesus as a homeless person. And I like to say it's only as shocking as the gospel is. But yes, it is shocking. It's fascinating that a lot of our biblical text, um, we're used to hearing, love your enemy. But we don't really see it represented in artwork. Love your enemy. And that's a challenge, and that's something that's shocking. And I think in order to grab the younger generations, uh, an accurate portrait of Christianity has to be representative, representative of the different aspects. It can't just be Mary had a little lamb, or they're not going to listen to it. They're not going to hear it. They're not going to see it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm, I study the Bible every single day obsessively. And what I'm trying to do is pull those absolute gems out that have never been represented in the artwork and put them out there with the bronze sculpture so people can see it. And I do believe that artwork, well, first of all, I do believe that Christianity is awesome. And if it was represented in the correct way, you would have tons, all young kids wanting to become Christian, wanting to read the the Confessions of St. Augustine, wanting to gather in the St. Thomas Aquinas, right? But it's just, that's not necessarily visually represented out there. And the visual is important. If you took, if you had told the corporation of uh, McDonald's that you can run your business, but no longer can you have anything visual, no billboards, no TV commercials, they would say, okay, we fold, we, we, we quit. And that's how powerful the visual is. And um, I don't think that the, the Catholic Church, or the Christians, are using it to their advantage. And many times I think they're using it at their disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, artwork can certainly touch a soul and bring them to Christ. Um, some people may never have an access to a Bible or hear one, and they would just see your sculpture, and that just might be the, the bridge to God and, and faith. That's wonderful. Um, it really, yeah, it, 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 that's 
really the way it is. Like, I, I'll just, like, right now I'm working on uh, a sculpture on Dante's Divine Comedy, which I would consider one of the greatest works of Christian literature ever. And it's, it's amazing. And how was I first of all introduced by it to Dante? It was seeing the illustrations and the artwork from the uh, uh, Inferno, actually, his representations of hell. And so me, myself here, um, I'm kind of an example of that. I, you know, it's the, the power of the visual is is very important. And so to use that to the best of our advantages is absolutely perfect, right? Wonderful. And so what about um, yourself? What have you learned um, from artwork um, in, in your faith? How has it taught you? Well, it's interesting because I, for 30 years I've been sculpting a Christian uh, sculptures, and you just um, you just can't go in without really uh, becoming very familiar with the subject matter. And so I consider uh, this, as far as I'm concerned, as a deeper, a real deep, deep uh, Bible study. And also, I almost consider it uh, my my life uh, a big one big prayer. And the interesting thing is, I thought about that this one time. I think it was two years ago when I was doing a set of stations across for a church down in Ohio, and I was sculpting. And I was thinking, okay, well, what, how should I the first station? How should I do Pontius Pilate? And so I have you know the scene that I'm working on, and and then I realize that you know you. You can you can widen your idea of what prayer is to be m not necessarily as passive as it's usually represented, but it can be an active prayer too. And I was thinking about my whole experience about doing the Stations of the Cross. Sure, I didn't have my eyes closed, and but I did have as I was working on it, as my hands were moving. I was kind of in this inventive prayer state, like I often am, um, and that's like, and that's like really exciting. And I hope that that other people in the uh, in the future will consider widening their definition of what prayer is. And so, one of the things I did in my studio around uh, around six years ago is I thought, well. If I could treat my, my, my studio, my workplace here, more like a chapel than just a workplace, if I, could, if I could even change the sound in it, and if I could perpetually have the Bible being played as I sculpt, and if I could actually just take it a little bit different in the way I perceive it, the artwork will probably benefit from it. And so I thought about that, and I, I also think that if, if more people take what they do as a form of prayer. You know, it's almost like there's like the little pieces of play, clay that I'm developing, that I'm adding, that I'm adding the hour upon hour. If I could get myself to think that those are more like rosary beads, and if I could get myself in a prayerful state while I'm working, then it doesn't hurt. And in fact, it could, it could actually, in the end result, have a finished uh, Christian sculpture that has more power. And so that's uh, that's what I think. Um, that's where I am at my studio now, at the age of fifty, after starting when I'm twenty, realizing that yeah, there's so much excitement, there's so much out there that that should be considered prayer, and we should kind of open up the the idea of of every place can be like a little chapel, and that. Um, that there's always that opportunity out there, not only for me, but I think for everyone in what they do. If you have a, a job that can be kind of a mundane, repetitious job, well, start using it like a rosary and, and start working that way. And so I think what we got to do as, as Christians, well, what I think might be a, a cool idea, is to kind of bring bring the church, even at this time of the virus where a lot of people can go to churches, but it'll bring the church into your life in different ways um, and uh, and broaden it out, widen it up, right? And so that's, what, that's kind of what I'm doing. How much have I learned about Christianity? Um, it's hard to distinguish that 
from my sculpture because I've, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm sculpting seven days a week for most of my life, and so I, I can't really, I don't really necessarily know where my life, my non-sculpting life stops <laughs> because it's all it's all merged in and fused in, and also the idea of Christianity is blended right within that too, right? And so it's hard to make a distinction. It's hard even to to see it from a from a kind of an objective stance. But it's awesome. It's, uh, I'm I'm I love it, and I do believe that my only concern is that I should do more sculptures. And uh, because there's you never know when God is going to throw down an amazing masterpiece in the center of your being that has to be done in the sculpture. And it's like the, the Angels Unaware sculpture that's in St. Peter's Square. For two years before that, I was thinking, how do I sculpt Hebrews 13 to be welcoming to strangers, many of entertain angels unawares? And it was only after coming back from Rome uh, with the request to do a sculpture of uh, refugees that the whole sculpture unfolded. And that's like, oh my God, this is so cool. It's almost like you develop a whole library of different scriptures, different sculptural ideas, and you can pull out one idea and then merge it with another. And that takes years to develop, but and it takes time. It takes time to do it, to develop that, that library there, and then to execute them and to bring them out into to birth, so to speak, so they're out there. It takes a lot of time. Um, but it's also like the homeless Jesus. That was just a, an inspiration. I was in downtown Toronto, haven't been in a big city for a while, and I saw this shrouded figure, this homeless person. And I just was instantly convinced that I saw something spiritual. In fact, I felt I just witnessed Christ. And I came back to my studio and sculpted that. And there I am out of my studio, and I'm thinking of my goodness, maybe I should get out of my studio more often. Um, but I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's wonderful. Offering your whole day to God, everything you do as prayer, and those little moments like a morning prayer where we just offer up everything. That's great. Um, one last question. Perhaps you could tell us, um, you mentioned last time, um, a little bit about that moment you had with with Pope Francis um, at the Vatican when you met him and you've done some sculptures for them at the Vatican and also a little bit about your latest um, work a little bit more. Yes, I certainly can. Um, to install the sculpture in St. Peter's Square, that's 20 feet, the angels unawares that has physically, literally, the scripture in the center of it, Hebrews 13, too. And to have been requested by Pope Francis to create the piece life-size um, was one of the most amazing experiences I've had. And all throughout the sculpting of it, I always in the back of my mind knew that, in a sense, I felt like um, Pope Francis was watching me because I was always sensitive about that um, this is to celebrate, promote, and honor one of his greatest uh, desires, and that is a more compassionate world for, for refugees. And so <laughs> at this one time, I'm, I'm working on this Muslim and that's right at the front of the boat, and I have her, you know, in her traditional dress, and I'm thinking, oh, it is just women in Quebec, they're having problems with religious symbols being worn in public, and I'm saying, oh my goodness, this piece is going to St. Peter's Square, and she is fully dressed, this Muslim. And I was thinking, maybe I should just have kind of a, a more subtle veil. And then I thought, hmm, what would St. Francis do? <laughs> what would he want me to do? And then I thought, no, he'd want me to make a Muslim look as totally Muslim as possible. And so I always had this idea that that um, that the sculpture was, was to celebrate his love and his concern for the refugee. And um, when he finally saw the life-size version, 
Um, I was walking around with uh, the piece with uh, Cardinal Cherney, who was, and and uh, Pope Francis, and uh, Cardinal Cherney was translating what I was describing. All the different pieces. It takes a while to walk around the piece, and um, at the end of it, uh, uh, Pope Francis looked at me. He put his hands on his heart, and that just meant so much to me because <laughs> he can't speak English, I can't speak Spanish or Italian, but that was a universal, one of the most wonderful universal gestures I could possibly hope for after the years of, of working as hard as I could on that sculpture for him. And um, it was amazing. And um, the piece that I'm Looking at right now, as I talk to you, is Let the Oppressed Go Free. And it's a similar sculpture with more than um, 20 feet of what will be bronze sculpture. Um, you have St. Paquita, who is the patron saint of the idea of freeing um, the oppressed. Um, she's become kind of the, the, the symbol of the human traffic uh, human trafficking concern for the Catholic Church. And St. Paquito was actually a, a, a slave from a previous century, from the late 1800s. She turned uh, Christian in Venice. She got her freedom. Uh, I think it was that her uh, uh, owners, uh, rich uh, Ven Venetian merchants, were really nice, and they just said, well, you can be free. Yeah, whatever, be free. And so she was a hardcore Christian, and what she has to say about slavery is awesome. What this sculpture says is that she is the hero. Here you have this St. Paquita uh, African from a previous generation opening up the ground and letting the modern-day slaves free. And so... It is a stunning, epic piece where I have more than a hundred different figures all at first struggling and being released and coming to freedom, thanks to St. Paquita. Let the oppressed go free. I think that's Isaiah 58. Um, the fascinating thing is after I had the design of the sculpture uh, worked out, I read what Pope Francis said about human trafficking. He said that, Human trafficking will always exist if it's kept underground. And so I like to think that almost word for word, my sculpture gives visual representation to that powerful statement that um, human trafficking has to be put above ground in the light of daylight so people can see it, so they can attack and stop the evil that's all around us in every single country. And so this is using sculpture as a tool. Um, a little billboard um, or a little poster in an airport saying, stop human trafficking is doing something. But a 20-foot bronze sculpture being placed in a major city center is going to become an obstacle in people's daily lives. And that obstacle is going to bring awareness and then change on the idea of how we treat other human beings in our world today. Wow, what a powerful message um, your sculpture is going to bring. Uh, and um, St. Josephine Bikita, because um, she she died in the 1940s, and so she's very re re relevant to today. And uh, she also forgave her captors, her slave owners, and she prayed for them. What a great witness she is. That's so wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we hope you are able one day in the future to talk to um, Catholic News World again about your wonderful ministry and prayer um, in art. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to talk to you again. Thank you. God bless.